Hello, everyone. This is Adrian Sinclair with apodcast.com, a podcast with interesting people. Today, my guest is Angela Polson, uh, the author of a book titled Divorce is Awesome. Good morning, Angela. How are you? Good morning. I'm happy to be here. Thanks. So we're going to be talking about uh, your book today, Divorce is Awesome, and I'm super excited about this. It's going to be uh, an interesting podcast and an and a, uh, interesting and, and somewhat controversial uh, topic. Uh, what made you write this book? Uh, first of all, I wanted to get all of my divorce stuff out of my head. So when I took it out of my head, I got to put it in a book. And then there were so many different stories going through divorce, talking with other people. I wanted to put out my positive experiences and kind of share what I learned, putting positive spin on things. You know, when I started my divorce and I started looking at, say, bookstores, Barnes and Noble, for example, in books, um, the divorce books were housed in the grief section. And I didn't really understand that. I wanted the fairy tale ending. I wanted the rainbows after the storm. Like, give me, yes, give me the horror part of it but also give me that good outcome at the end. So I didn't see a lot of that there. I was so past the getting over the breakup idea that I wanted something that gave the whole rest of the story, the positive outcomes, like I say, the rainbows after the storm. So that's the book I wrote. And it talks not only about how I got to the point of deciding that this is what needed to happen as far as filing for divorce, but it also talked about the legal aspects, things that lawyers don't tell you and they assume you know. Um, I talked about dealing with kids in a tough situation and the custody battles that ensued. Um, I had 27 social service visits to my home because my kids were actually put into protective custody by the county after threats were received from my ex against us. So there's a lot of struggles when you're going through a divorce. And so maybe mine was more extreme. I'm sure there's more extreme cases out there. But I wanted to have that positive spin on it too, how I took all that negative and made it into the positive. And that's what my focus was. And I did get my fairy tale ending at the end. <laughs> and we'll talk about that too. Uh, sure. So you open up uh, the book and I'm reading uh, from your book over here, uh, a quote by Nelson Mandela, which says, it always seems impossible until until it's done. What made you choose sure. that uh, quote as an opening quote for your book? Because, you know, when you're going through such a big life change and you're trying to make it okay for the kids and you're trying to make it okay for yourself and you've got all these financial things happening, you've got court things happening where you most likely have never had experience before in a courtroom, you've got all that and it does seem impossible. Like you're nervous, you've got the shakes going into the courtroom, that kind of a thing. But then you come out and you're like, I did that. You know, and every little piece that you uh, overcome or accomplish, that brings you closer to the possible. So once it's done, you're like, yeah, I did all that. And it, and it had to be done. There wasn't much choice in the matter. And it came through on the other side. So that's that was why I chose that quote. In the beginning of your book, you talk about when you were going through this uh, this ordeal, and it is an ordeal. You were looking at other books out there, like self help books, and and uh, you found, you know, ba basically a lot of books just dealing with the aftermath of it, right? Like how to uh, how to get how to get out of the um, the sadness of those feelings, you know, the, the sense of failure maybe. Um, and um, was that one of the reasons why you? why you were i guess considering to you know writing a, a a book with a different perspective which is which is what your book is, is is doing tell us a little bit more about how is your book different than the books that you mainly see on those bookshelves in the grieving sections yeah i um wanted that perspective to come through as divorce is a positive you know going through my divorce the first thing people said to me oh i heard you're getting divorced i'm so sorry well don't be sorry that i'm getting out of a negative situation because it's a positive change. I look at divorce as a start over, a do over, a chance at happiness, maybe where you didn't have it, a chance at peace where you had chaos. So that's the whole perspective I wanted to bring to it, that divorce is a good thing. Nobody gets divorced because they're in a good relationship. You know, if you've got a good marriage, you're not even going to consider it. And by the time you've considered divorce, there's probably been so many 
things that have happened that you've probably should have been divorced two years ago, you know, that type of a thing. So it's a long time in coming. And once you decide on it, it should be looked over as, as like a congratulations, that kind of a reaction, because it's a new beginning. And that's what we do for new beginnings, new babies, uh, graduations, weddings, you know, we, we give out those congratulations. There should be congratulations on your divorce greeting cards, you know, napkins. Why are we not throwing a party? So it's that whole stigma we have to get over that divorce isn't a fail. You, there's already been failures along the way. You're, you're recognizing that it's not working anymore and you're making a change. That's where I think the big shift needs to be in society. When you were um, publishing this book, and we're gonna talk about that as well, like your, your, your journey through actually trying to publish the book, because there's such a huge social stigma with with uh, with divorce, right? It's 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 being thought of like as some kind of a you know marital failure. It's it's like you know we tried things, it didn't work. We're you know and people like you say people are you know just sad for you, like oh I'm sorry it didn't work out for you. You put a different perspective on it, like as what you just said right now. You know we already passed that. We tried everything, it didn't work. This is the this is the you know separation and now we're we're heading separate ways and you you get a control back of your life right and you are so that, those are the positive things yet society is not viewing it that way right they you know, society still thinks it's like well it's a failure why do you think why do you think they uh you know it's such a there's still such a huge stigma around that if it's a positive thing well i grew up in a strict catholic family first of all and you know that was never even considered to be an option to get a divorce. It's just not what you did. So I think religion sometimes has a role in it. I think there's an embarrassment factor where it's like, oh, you're getting a divorce. Well, who did what wrong? And you know, it's that airing of the dirty laundry business. Um, I think too, that people feel that, you know, you hear a lot of times when women and men as well get divorced, you know, we're keeping it together. We're staying together for the kids. And I think that realization that I was doing more of a disservice to the kids than an actual service by staying in my relationship, that that was one of the factors that really pushed me to file. Um, when my kids were telling me, you know what, this isn't good anymore. You know, you need to listen to your kids and understand that that's part of it too, where they don't feel they're in a safe situation. They feel like they're living in chaos all the time. And I think that's part of the decision-making process. Your relationship should be an example of what you want your kids to model as, you know, when they grow up and they start dating and they marry and that type of thing, if they choose to do that, your relationship should be how to be a model of just how to treat other people, even in not a romantic or spouse or, you know, partner relationship, just how to treat other people. Should you be fighting all the time? Should you be name calling all the time? Should there be such distrust in a relationship? You know, you need to think about, are you modeling the best you can for your kids? And are you doing right by yourself? If every day is a struggle, that's no way to live your life. I'm reading over here uh, some of the notes that I took as I was reading your book. And um, the one thing that kind of spoke to me is, um, you know how you you shine a perspective on the positive aspect of of uh, of getting divorced, right? It's the um, you know the rest of your life is is ahead of you, and and after the divorce, you are um, you are uh, in back in control, and you know obviously divorce should be be thought of as a positive resolution to a persistent problem. Yes. It it boggles my mind, like why there's still such a uh, social stigma around it, right? I mean, and you know, coming from a uh, family, my parents are divorced uh, when I was a kid, so that was that clearly affects affects uh, um, everyone in in the relationship, in in the marriage, in that partnership. But if it doesn't work, and if it's you know, um, if you tried everything, you went through all the steps, you you tried to salvage it, you try to work it out, and it still doesn't work, then then you know that kind of resolution is is a is a positive thing. Yet yet still people think it's it's just like this, this stigma around it, and um, I don't know. Maybe times will change and um, and people will view it in a in a different light. Um, now that you've gone through this this process, um, 
going back, if you could step into a time machine, and we're going to go also like how you went through the, you know, the court uh, part and, and all of that, because I'm super interested uh, in how that uh, worked out and what did you learn in that. But now that you're kind of over the um, the whole uh, process um, and you're, a, uh, you're remarried, yeah. if you could step back into a time machine, what would you do differently? What like what are some of the lessons learned that you, uh, that you would apply now and say like, well, this here's a couple of things that I would do differently, and what are you doing differently in your uh, in your second marriage? Um, what I do differently through the divorce process, I probably would have stopped responding to my ex a lot sooner because there really was no response that was going to get anything positive back. It was kind of like a game being played where, okay, I'll nitpick just this phrase that you texted me and then I'm gonna use that against you in some way. So I probably would have stopped responding a lot sooner. Um, I actually have not responded to any texts or phone calls or any messages of any sort with my ex since February of 2016. However, last um, or this past Christmas, this 2019 Christmas, within the week of Christmas, I received eight messages from him. So he's still trying. So um, I guess to me, that just gave me a sense of peace where I didn't, where I realized I didn't have to respond anymore. I didn't have to, no one was making me. And sometimes the best response is no response. So I wish I would have learned that a lot earlier. It would have saved me a lot of time trying to convince an irrational person of rational things. You know, there is no reasoning with the unreasonable. So I wish I would have learned that sooner. Um, as far as going into a new relationship, I think it's really important to not bring your old relationship into it. You know, you, you hear a lot about the baggage, don't bring your baggage in, into your new relationship. And it's um, retraining your brain on how to react and how not to react. And I had so many instances where my gut reaction was to distrust or to tell someone what to do all the time. Otherwise, maybe it wouldn't get done. You know, I had told you previously about the gas story where when I first started dating my now husband, I said, you know, you need to get gas pretty soon. You're at a quarter of, the, of a tank. And this was one of our first dates. And he's like, okay. I said, but you need to, you need to get that. Cause what if you run out of gas? And you know, sometimes that happens to people cause that had happened with my ex and you know, my previous relationship. And, and he said, here's the deal. You don't need to worry about that. I'm a grown adult. And in this relationship, I'll take care of you. So I, that was a different perspective that I had never, I had never experienced before. And you know, there was another time where we were at a water park with another family and one of the kids from the other family had a headache, went back up to the room. We came back again to the water park with, with my set of kids. And then in the meantime, the kid felt better. He came down the stairs to the water park while we were going up the stairs to get back to the hotel room. And so there was now a lost child. So long story short, my husband, now my present husband went out to look for the kid and so he wasn't back right away in 10 minutes and and immediately i'm in tears thinking he left like he left us he left us in this hotel you know and he came back and he's like what is the matter with you and i said well i thought you left he's like where am i gonna go i don't have car keys we're in a hotel on a vacation but it was just that mindset like immediately oh we're abandoned you know and you have to retrain yourself not to overreact and not to react through that same lens that had been your previous your previous life basically it's you're not how do you do that, that how do you do that um <laughs> <laughs> you gotta check yourself you know and, and a lot of it was my my new husband stopping and saying and just looking at me i'm not him and it was just that kind of reminder where it's like, yeah, you're right. I'm not. What am I, what am I still treating the situation as if you were him? You know, and just even that that little thing, I'm not him. That that just got me back into, yeah, this is new. So I was in my past relationship for 24 years. We were high school sweethearts. So that's a lot of time in one mode where now you have to get out of that and get back in. And it probably took me a good year and a half to catch myself where I don't do that anymore. I'm not always waiting for the next shoe to drop. If somebody's 10 minutes late, I don't think they're, you know, out doing who knows what. 
I, you know, you give people the benefit of the doubt a little bit more. So, and yeah, so that, a, that was the big mm-hmm. takeaways. So it's a, so it's a uh, conscious effort to catch yourself uh, when you're thinking in sort of like the old patterns. Um, are you doing anything else? Uh, different people cope in different ways. Um, I'm curious, like, w- what are some of the techniques and things that you do? Like some people meditate. What else, other than just kind of that uh, conscious, uh, um, you know, technique of like trying to catch yourself that, oh, I'm thinking in the old ways. Uh, now I need to kind of reframe everything. What else do you do to kind of uh, help yourself uh, in the new relationship uh, to make sure that everything works and that um, and that you're not just kind of falling back into your old way of thinking? I think a lot of it too is catching yourself and sometimes the less said it, the better. You know, you don't want all of these um, negative things to come out like i could i'm real good with comebacks so i could really quickly say what my first thought is but is it is it necessary you know and a lot of the little arguments that come up say in a grocery store oh well how come you're getting that we just had that last you know just this the silly little things if someone's being silly like that you know in our relationship now we just look at each other and say i love you so much and that's kind of our signal to be like you know what this is not worth it this is not worth even really a discussion and it brings it to the forefront where what's the importance the importance is that we're we're in a loving relationship and you know in the grocery store example i had a little old lady walk by us as you know one of us said this to the other and she said oh i just love seeing you know couples so in love with each other that they're willing to just say I love you so much even in the middle of a grocery store so you know it's a good reminder to have those little maybe key phrases with the partner where you go you know I'm at my limit and we're just done here you know and sometimes it's really most of the time it's not worth a conversation to come back to you know because it was such a little nitpicky thing and you don't want those little things to build into a big thing and that's one of the things that I've learned as well in the new relationship. I'll trade you, I'll give you some value for value, value from your book with uh, with something that I've learned from uh, my recent, uh, one of my recent guests on the podcast, uh, Dr. Julie Lopez, who wrote a book on uh, titled Live Empowered. And she's, uh, um, uh, she's talking in it about uh, um, intrinsic memories or uh yeah memories that like memories in your subconsciousness like things that you don't even have like access to sometimes we do things like on autopilot we don't even know why and i found that super interesting because um there are like different ways of of trying to rewire and cope with new things right there is a way of um you know talking to someone uh my wife is a uh, mental health counselor and you know talking things out and and going through that process is super healthy and i know in your book you mentioned that as well you know talking to counselors and 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 working that out that's kind of like one aspect one of the things that i'm really grateful on this show is when i talk to different uh, um, guests i learn always something new and from from dr julie lopez i've learned you know some of the techniques that are available um, that i would never ever know about how to deal with these uh with these memories that are sort of stuck in the in subconsciousness where, where those are the things that will kind of prompt you to do things in a certain way that you don't even know why you just behave that way because you always have and being in a 24 uh, year relationship as you were in you know you know how it is with couples everybody has their own kind of like modality and dynamic right it's you kind of are set in ways and trying to reprogram that on a conscious level is a is a is a task uh, you know uh, it's a monumental task but dealing with the subconscious things that you you know you mentioned some of that like you, you know quick retorts you know you might be just like just snapping and, and replying to, to 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 someone just because you always done that but maybe that's one of those things that is you know irritating to the other you know to to, to your partner and something that you don't even realize that because you've been doing it forever and and so reprogramming that is it can be a challenge so uh, I'm glad that you kind of you said that that you know those are the things that you catch, and also val- you know uh, check out that book uh, Live Empowered. It's 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 really great uh, talking about all those other things that we can do to kind of change our subconscious stuff. Your book is uh, part memoir and part how to book. Uh, let's talk about some of the how tos. Uh, share some of them. For the rest of them, you'll have to pick up the book and dive into it and and, and learn everything from uh, from Angela. Uh, but give me some of the how tos um, as you were going through the process of of divorce, and uh, 
what were some of the things that you, you know, the top three, maybe top five, whatever you want to share in terms of like lessons learned. Um, share some of the things that you, you want to share with someone who is going through a s same or similar situation that you were in. I think one of the big things is being a self advocate. Um, lawyers often don't tell you everything that you need to know because for them it's second nature. That's what they do every day. For example, I didn't know that you could file for child support before you were divorced. So I lost out on many months of that. Um, you know, there's a lot of groups out there that could help you with that. There's different support groups. There's different, um, um, like at a women's shelter, they have different support people that can be advocates for you in a court room as well. And, you know, just working yourself around the court system, that is a tricky business. And I had a lawyer for a lot of it. And then at a certain point, you know, like I say, after the divorce, when I still had 20 more court cases to go, I kind of got sick of paying for things. And I, I educated myself enough um, through online. There's a lot of state statutes that you need to be aware of on, you know, depending on your state, you can find those all online. You can um, look up in books, you can just talk to people, but yeah, being a self advocate is really an important part of the divorce process and you know being very careful and meticulous about signing things being very word for word reading every sentence over and over in, in different custody arrangements and different divorce decrees you know there's a crazy story that i have it's it's one of i don't want to say favorite because it's so ridiculous but one of the most strange oddest situations that i went through in my divorce was over a particular sentence in the divorce decree and i was at the dentist taking my four kids for a cleaning and i had actually two squad cars show up to arrest me so they had um, inadvertently called my ex's phone number for the reminder appointment and so he ended up showing up to the dentist but stayed outside in the vehicle and then called the police saying i was illegally bringing my kids to the dentist. So like I say, they sent two squads and he was trying to go off of the fact that he thought was a fact that I was only able to bring children to the doctor and he was only able to bring the children to the dentist, which in a rational person's mind, there's no judge ever that's going to say one parent only is allowed to bring, you know, the kids for these kinds of medical treatments and another parent's only allowed to bring the kids for these kind. you know, that just doesn't make sense. But he had confused who paid for the premiums. So I was paying medical premiums, he was paying dental premiums. So in his mind, he turned that into, he was allowed to bring kids to the dentist, thus I should be arrested. So it's silly things like that when you don't understand how legal documents work. And I wasn't arrested, by the way. Um, I ended up telling him, well, if that's the case, then bring, bring a copy of the divorce decree, show the police officers. And I'm sure he ended up paying upwards of $300 for his lawyer to truck over a copy of the divorce decree. But you know, that's, that's on him too. But it, it's just knowing and understanding what legally things mean, and what the ramifications of not knowing what, what your divorce decree or your legal things, um, the decrees that come from the court mean, you know, and, and I was always trying to follow rules as far as getting the kids their right um, custody time, you know, getting them to where they need to be in the custody times. But there'd be random things like my ex would send me a map 15 minutes prior and saying, I want a new location for the custody drop off. Well, I'm already on the road and I'm not looking at a computer to find out how to get you. So I should have not tried as hard in those things because when it's set up in the legal document, it's set up in the legal document. So I think that's an important part of divorcing in general is knowing how the law works and knowing what binding legal documents are and how binding they are. I think that's a big takeaway that I had. Sounds like a uh, fairly adversarial um, ordeal that you went through with your ex-husband. For sure. <laughs> so you're a, you're, yeah. a, you're a survivor. You are a survivor. I suppose so. <laughs> yeah, who gets <laughs> the police called them for bringing their kids to the dentist? <laughs> right. I mean, that's Only me. I, guess. <laughs> um, I can imagine how that kind of escalates that kind of tit for tat, um, uh, you know, uh, relationship. And then you're like, oh, what what can I do to to that person? And 
How do you cope in terms of like the um, you know just sanity of it? Uh, so you got the legal part where you have to deal with the legalities of it. Uh, you know, some help, some help with lawyers. But how do you turn, uh, how do you turn this into, you know, uh, how do you cope with it emotionally? Like when th something like that happens, did you, um, uh, you know, what were some of your strategies other than just getting really pissed off about it and and just, you know, trying to, uh, you know, plan things out? <laughs> but how do you, how do you deal with it like emotionally? And we're going to get into that as well because uh, I want to just tell you that Angela is also a uh, a, a fiction author right now. And she's 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 writing some books, so I'm I'm no, suspecting, the, the scary yeah, stories. <laughs> yeah, the scary story. So I'm suspecting, uh, not to put it put a, put a, put you on the spot over here, but I'm suspecting that that's a part of your coping mechanism. So we'll talk about that as well. But before you before you wrote the other um, uh, started writing the other uh, books, uh, not, the fiction books, uh, how how did you cope with with situations like that that you just described right now when your husband, uh, you know, basically uh, sent uh, you know police uh, on you. Well, that wasn't the only time he sent the police for me. But anyway, yeah, I think it's the it goes back to what I am as a person. Like I see my role first and foremost as the mother. So what would I want my kids to see my reaction to be? I think that kept me in a check in check a lot because you don't want the situation escalated and you certainly don't want them to be even more stressed out than what was going on you know in the original situation to begin with so i think just keeping yourself in check like how do i want to be perceived and do i want my ex do i want the other person that's trying to cause this chaos chaos do i want to give them the satisfaction of reacting how they think i'm going to react and you know that was part of the whole starting to be um just in, I've heard this in, in other groups that I have become a part in, Facebook groups, where you just gray rock. And that just means you are a stone, you give no emotion, that type of thing, because that is the opposite of what they are expecting from you. And so if you are not giving them the reaction they expect and they are wanting, hopefully, hopefully, eventually it'll get better and they'll stop trying to create that reaction, or at least it'll be a lesser reaction that or a, a lesser um response than what they would have originally kept on going with so yeah it's it's just kind of stopping and going is this really what i want other people to see as my reaction and you know a lot of it too is oh i have to do this i have to go to court i have to you know fix the car i have to repaint this i have to repair this you know those type of things just switching the word from have to 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 get to i get to shovel my driveway i get to charge groceries on a credit card because we're short this week i get to do that because i have the means to do that and i'm i'm thankful and grateful that i do have the means to do that i'm thankful for youtube videos where i can make small car repairs myself you know it's it's i get to versus i have to so that really helped me getting through a lot of the struggles and a lot of stopping my reaction before it started so that's that's one of the tips that i would give anybody as well just changing that that word i have to to i get to so it sounds sounds like a uh, shift in perspective um that helped out and i can second that it's it is just so critical to train yourself to shift your perspective and look at things from a from a different side uh i it's it's unbelievable how your attitude, your emotions, and everything can change, literally by just shifting that by changing some of the words, words that that evoke certain emotions. So you, like if you have something in your mind, like oh I have to do this, you, there might be a negative connotation, like oh my gosh, you know it's it's a chore that I have to deal with it. But if I get to do it, now you recontextualize it, and you're like hey, I have the freedom of doing that right now, and with that come maybe happier emotions, and you are just not ticked off by it and you just kind of re you know reevaluate how how that makes you feel and and suddenly it's not it's you know it doesn't ruin the rest of your day <laughs> yes and you can certainly do that in little things it doesn't have to be a big life-changing event yeah i have to do laundry or i get to you know i'm thankful that i have a washer and dryer in my house where i don't have to maybe go to the laundromat so i mean you, you just start changing like you said perspective and just retraining and it does take practice and you're not going to retrain your way of thinking in a week. I mean, it's it's going to take longer and you're always working at it. But I think that's the perspective 
that's the big thing. You need to change that perspective and in, into a more positive way. And, and that could be a lesson for everyone in every single situation they're in. Who and what or or um, what else was a uh, factor in supporting you during this process? Did you build some kind of a social support network? Was your family helping out? Did you how did you engage in that to kind of uh, help yourself, um, you know, cope with with this uh, with this whole process? You know, my kids were a big support, not that I put things on them, but just again, knowing that I needed to be strong for them and get things done. My parents were a huge support. I had, you know, family and friends. I did take um, some time and I went to counseling for a few sessions and that is in my book as well. And, you know, even listening to others, I never thought, oh, go to counseling to fix things. But, you know, they, they ask you a few pointed questions where you learn a little bit more about yourself and then how you viewed the world thus far. And I think that was a big factor for me, even in the um, office when I was filling out the checklist to get into counseling for my first initial appointment. And, you know, I guess I'm not good at following directions in, in checklists because I usually have, you know, all these paragraphs next to the boxes that you mark. And, and after each box that was an issue, I started to realize, and this was days later when I was thinking about it, it didn't even occur to me in the waiting room, but I had started to write because of husband on all of these different issues, you know, as far as the things I had checked. And then a few days later, like I said, I, I looked at it and I went, well, then why don't I just get rid of the husband? If he's all the problem, then why don't we just get rid of that? You know, but there were a few point, point questions that the counselor asked, like, how long has it been since you felt you had a partner? I'm like, well, I've never had a partner. I, I just take care of it all. And then I thought, but wait, that's not a relationship. You know, and it just took that question for, to, you know, for um, that thought to be signaled. And another one that really put things in perspective was, well, how long have you been a caregiver? I'm like, well, all my life, that's what I do. I take care of it all. I take care of everything. And I mean, I'm a teacher, you know, so that's, that's like a chosen profession of mine. And once I realized that I didn't have to take care of every, everybody else, like I wasn't in charge of other people's happiness, it kind of was a freeing moment. And my mom, when I was growing up, would, would say I had a dead bird syndrome. You know, I, I had, I don't know, animals really flocked to me. So I'd always have I'd have birds land on my shoulder, which was a weird thing as a kid, you know, and I'd have the strays come and the little cats, you know, in our neighborhood. But I'd find birds that were dead. They had obviously hit a window. And, you know, if a bird hits a window, they look fine, but they've got that real floppy neck, you know. Mm. And she and I'd say, oh, we can totally fix this. It's fine. It's not bleeding. It, it looks good. She's like, the neck is clearly broken on that bird, you know. And I kind of was like, I literally am in this caretaking mode where I'm trying to fix things that are dead. I can't fix this marriage anymore. It's dead. And it was a strange sign. And, you know, you wonder if there's this, uh, this higher power or whatever is trying to help you along in your path. And I was literally in the counselor's office and a bird hit the window. And I thought, this is a, you know, that was my turning point. This relationship is a dead bird. And then another time on the way to sign divorce papers, the truck in front of me hit a goose. And so then its mate was freaking out in the road. You know, my kids are crying. I stop. I'm calling the police. Like, what are the police going to do about a dead goose? But I felt like I needed to do something. You've got four, you know, kids in the back seat of your car freaking out. Do something, mom, you know. And so I called and the sheriff came down and he basically, the for the injured goose, he broke its neck and tossed it unceremoniously just in the side of the ditch. And I'm like, that's it? That's all you're going to do? He's like, they get over it. He'll find a different mate. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And mm -hmm. I thought, there's my dead bird again. You know, it'll be fine. We'll, it, it'll happen. It'll, you know, we'll get somebody new or we won't. And that's fine too. You know, but it'll be okay. That was another sign for me. So yeah, sometimes those things come out of nowhere but all for a reason, you know. So it sounds like a lot of um, you, you, you got, you took, you got a lot of strength out of um, those moments of, um, I don't know, I don't want to call it enlightening, but uh, enlightenment, but um, more of a self-realization that, you know, things will be okay. I'm going to get through this. 
yeah. and also let me look at this from a different perspective as well so as to not get into my old way of thinking so that's what i'm kind of getting so far from you think about things from different perspectives internalize things that you know this is not you know this is not the end of the road things will be okay and kind yeah. of drawing strength uh from that so uh, do you remember the moment when you decided to uh, to write this book you know I don't know if I decided on the moment. Um, I had so many journals written that I, I guess I didn't realize how much I had written throughout the, as you said, ordeal, because it certainly was. So the book kind of wrote itself. And, you know, when other people that I knew started getting divorced, I thought, oh, well, maybe this is something that would help someone, you know, putting all my stories instead of just telling them it could help further um, past my little inner circle of friends, you know, it could help some other people. Because one of the ladies at my work, she said, you know, I decided to get divorced because of you. I'm like, oh, great. You know, <laughs> that wasn't my point. But she said, but it's just that you're so happy now. And I want that. And you're showing me with all the stories you've told me that it gets better. And that's why I want to do what you did. You know, so it's not that I'm out at saying, please, everyone get divorced. You know, that's not what it is. But there's that life after divorce where when you're going through all of those struggles or even still in that negative relationship, you don't realize. And, you know, there's there's people that have said to me, you can't heal in the place that made you sick. And so I think you need to take a break for a little bit, even if it's a separation, take a break, see what's what, where you're not inside of that chaos so much. But yeah, the book kind of just came out of me wanting to help other people because I thought, boy, if I had this book, I maybe would have done things a little differently. I would have stopped responding to ridiculous sooner, you know, ridiculousness sooner. I would have known more about the legal system. I would have known more about how child support worked. And I would have known, I would have just known some different things. And, you know, those books too, a lot of them, if they're a little more technical, they're always written by the PhDs. And here's how you should feel. And here's what you need to do. And I just wanted a real regular person that could give me a perspective like that. So I guess that person was me. So let's talk about your process and your experience publishing this book because with a divorce uh, is awesome as a title and the, um, <laughs> the sort of stigma that kind of floats around the um, divorce and everything. How, how easy, how hard was it to, uh, to deal with publishers? What did you decide to do? Um, how was, how was that whole process, um, you know, getting the, the book published? Um, I, did a lot of research as far as how to query authors, you know, the, the dreaded query letters, the synopsis writing, all of that stuff. And, you know, finally, I wasn't getting any hits. And so finally, I thought, well, if I could just sell myself face to face, because I could talk for hours about this. I mean, it's my life, so it's easy to talk about. So if I could just get something face to face with someone, I know I could sell myself and my idea, you know, to the point where I could get someone to buy it. Um, so what I did, I started going to writing conferences and I went to our, our state, I'm from Minnesota, so I went to our state writing conference down in um, St. Paul and I decided to sign up for some pitch sessions and I pitched to someone that was acquiring for her um, entire office. And I said, I know this isn't specifically for you, but I think it would be a good fit for, you know, and then the person that, was into acquiring memoir, self-help, that kind of thing. And she's like, absolutely, here's my recommendation. Make sure that you tell her that I have sent you and all of that. And so I wrote her and she did a really nice detailed, I mean, it was the best rejection letter, I guess, if you can, <laughs> if you, you know, can have a good attitude about it. Um, she said, here's the deal. I love it. I love the idea. It's a different perspective. It's an eye-catching title, that kind of a thing. She said, but you're just not famous enough. And, you know, the trend in publishing is what she, she told me is that, you know, they are looking right now for people that are well established, absolutely going to sell 100 million copies. For example, Michelle Obama's biography, you know, it's going to sell in an instant, you know, any book that's by some type of celebrity, otherwise you get 
a little buried, you know, and people don't want to take a chance. She said, I would, I would take this book on if I didn't have to then go to publishers and try to convince them that somebody that has no name, you know, is going to sell the amount of money they're expecting. So then I started looking into other options. If this isn't really going to get sold, I need to make it happen somehow. And I went and I decided to self-publish. I looked up a lot of self-publishing avenues. A lot of people wanted a lot of money, thousands of dollars to print the book. And I thought, there's got to be a better way where I could do this legwork myself. So I did um, research Amazon and publishing through their KDP, which is the Kindle Direct Publishing. And is it a lot of work? Sure. You know, I did all my own editing. I, on another website, not through Kindle, but on another website, I designed my cover, I designed my back bio page and all of that. And so then I was able to take those and upload them into Kindle and they do eBooks and they also do a print on demand. So then I was not having to pre-purchase tons of boxes of books and store them and taking a chance, you know, that I'd be left with a lot of product or whatever it was or needed to set up a shop in order to get things sold. So they do a really nice job of print on demand. Um, and then the eBooks, you know, obviously you can download instantly and that's been a real learning process for me but also you look at that book and when your author copy comes you know in the mail you go i did this i wrote a book and you know there's not many people out there that can say that and i was pretty impressed with um sales and by any means they're not to be compared with you know you know stephen king I, i'm not going to be that guy but i would just just to get the word out and to get this out there and be like, this could help you. Cause I've had such good feedback too, from people that have contacted me after the fact. And, you know, I've had comments from, thank you for writing my story. Like, I feel like I was reading about my own self and obviously there's going to be unique things. I'm sure she didn't have the police called on her at the dentist, you know, but there's, there's this underlying story of struggles in all of the court, battles you have to do. There's always going to be with kids a custody battle. There's going to be the child support issue, you know, and all the emotions that come through it and all of the perspective that probably you do need to change in order to be a healthy person, you know, and staying positive. So that was a great comment. I even had someone, and this is the craziest one, I had someone contact me and said, I think I dated your ex-husband. And she had. <laughs> and we went to dinner and it was a hoot. <laughs> So that, that was hilarious, you know, but you never know who you're going to reach. And, you know, it could be people across the country. I know there's a guy in England that bought my book off Amazon because it had the .uk after it, you know, and you can see where, where the different um, countries, you know, where sales are coming from. So that's pretty cool that I'm across the water and it's pretty cool that I helped out somebody in the own town, you know, in my hometown. So it's, it's, a nice thing with Amazon too, where it's, it's everywhere, you know, who doesn't buy stuff off Amazon? Everybody. So it's, it's easily purchased. It's easily found. You know, you can read a snippet on there. You can read my bio on there. And if it's something you think maybe would help you, or, you know, there's a different market perspective where is your daughter, is your son going through divorce? Is, is there a relative? Are your parents going through divorce? You know, there's those kinds of people can help. People that just want to say you're a teacher. You have so many students in your classroom that have dealt with stuff and you think about, you know, trauma and what they're dealing with. And maybe they didn't sleep last night because X, Y, and Z happened with mom and dad. You know, so you, you could take it from that kind of perspective. Counselors like your wife, you know, just another perspective on what people are going through. And um, another big part of it is if you just want to read a story. I mean, who hasn't read a biography before? And it's just, there's some interesting stuff in there and, and maybe you relate to it and maybe you go, geez, I'm glad I'm not her. And that's fine too, you know? So yeah, it, there's just a, a lot of people that could, I think, benefit from a book or any self-help book. And you mm -hmm. could take it into not even a divorced relationship, but say you have a friend that's, turned into, you know, now a toxic type person or even a sibling that that could be the case. Do you then start using some of these techniques or you, do you start kind of removing yourself from that relationship in order for you to be a healthier person and for you to have a healthier life? 
the process of, of uh, ex um, writing things down is uh, is a healing process uh, by itself. Some people write journals. You yeah. um, you you wrote you have memoirs. I mean, this is sort of like a, a memoir, but you wrote journals and um, and publishing it. Yeah, the market is huge right now, but you never know who you're going to reach, right? I mean, I recommend, and um, yeah, I'm in Utah right now, and I'm reaching out to all sorts of different podcasters over here, and I encourage everyone to go through this. Um, it's it's a it's exploratory. I'm a lifelong learner. I love learning new things. I love learning from people's experiences because that's to me that's a shortcut to uh, to to expanding your knowledge without really well in sort of compressed time right and and then on savory experiences too um and then you'd never know who you're going to reach right so even if it's one person even if it's dozen people that will benefit from from your book or from from your podcast or from your engagement with with someone that is a that is a um that is an impact and if someone can benefit that's a value and so um, i'm super glad that you wrote this book what is next for you in terms of um you know building this out or you know because clearly you wrote this because well for yourself but also to to share it with other people so so others can benefit from it what else are you planning to do with this how else are you planning to kind of uh continuing on uh with this and um any any plans any thoughts hopefully not a sequel to this book <laughs> Well, we'll save that for the fiction, all the stuff I wanted to do, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I did make a Facebook group and I just created it yesterday. And I have it titled by the same title as the book, Divorce is Awesome. And, and I created that group. So it's like a support group, but but more to leave the positive side of things. What worked for you? What what advice would you leave someone else? Could you share some of your positive stories? What were your outcomes? That kind of a thing where it's not just, um, oh, here's what my ex did now. You know, it's not one of those types of groups, but just sharing some of that positive talk and giving people some hope out there. You know, hope can be a terrible thing where it makes you stay in a negative relationship, but then it can also be a good thing that that's like, yes, there is a beyond here. And that's what I'd like to have as well, you know, have people have conversations about the book, have conversations about their experience. Cause you know, we talked about the stigma. A lot of people don't want to talk about divorce, their experiences, or they're kind of embarrassed, or they think it's, you know, something that is private. So the more we bring things to the forefront, the more we realize that we're very similar and we've had shared experiences. And you know, those shared experiences are sometimes the ones that bond you the closest. You know, some people, they they call it trauma bonding, which is a way to look at it too, because, you know, things like this kind of a change are traumatic experiences and your body reacts to them as such, you know, with the, the heart rate, the, you, you lose weight, you can't eat, that kind of stuff. But, you know, then sharing the hope, the after story, that kind of a thing. So hopefully that, um, Facebook page I set up, you know, can be part of it. I also have a Facebook business page. People can share and leave comments. And these are all new endeavors I'm starting. So there's not a lot of things as far as posting on there. But yeah, that's that's the conversation I want to start. What works for you? Help people out, you know, that kind of a thing. And band together and not just make it about all the negative that I could share with you about my ex. You know, this is my story and I want it to have that positive outcome and, and share not just that to be a focus, him, the other party to be a focus, but the outcomes and what's come from it, you know, like, like I'm remarried now and that's, that's worked out very well. And I've learned so much on how to be a better wife and, you know, less said the better sometimes some of the things we've already talked about. So yeah, it's those kinds of things I'd like to have, like kind of a tips and tricks page almost, you know, to mm -hmm. have people get together and share some of those more positive aspects of the struggles they've dealt with so there's two things that this uh, i want to put a bookmark uh, in right now one is how to be a better partner from your experience how to be a better wife um but also i wanted to kind of say that being a teacher uh and and talking about things and and, and teaching others maybe there is a uh, um a way for you uh moving forward with also being a, a public speaker and uh, and talking about these things and you know maybe 
hopefully even through a podcast like this as a platform to 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 talk about it and uh and sharing some of those tips so uh, i'm just going to kind of plug it in in the future if you wanted to to do uh you know maybe a recorded session in which we you know talk about some of the new tips and tricks and and you know pro tips that you've learned and want to share i would invite you to do that but in the meantime in your now you know in your second marriage right now how are you how are you uh um how have you changed some things what are some of the tips or trick or tricks that you uh that you can mention to being a be better partner in a new relationship um beyond those uh different things about sometimes less said the better catching yourself before you say something where certain feelings start to build and having those little signal phrases or words like i'm done here we'll come to back to this later you know i think there's a respect issue i think there's a trust issue and it's obviously a lot easier to do when you don't have someone that is breaking your trust so i mean i think choosing well is part of it too and knowing what is an absolute deal breaker i think those things are important going into a relationship um but then also knowing that you need each other's times, I think that was that was part of not necessarily a problem, but I think it was one of the things that my ex and I struggled with is that giving each other enough time to do things on our own. Because like I said, we were high school sweethearts, so we did everything together. And you know, it's okay if my husband wants to go with friends and go watch football, and it's okay if I'm going out with friends, you know, and there's not that jealousy factor where there was in my previous marriage there's just not that jealousy because there's also the aspect that if i say i'm going to be somewhere that's where i actually am so i think that trust has already been set up and it's just about being respectful and respectfully speaking if you have some kind of disagreement it's it's not reverting to name calling or saying things that are going to build these regrets later on you know it's just stating facts of you know you're frustrated right now what can i do to help which sounds silly but how many times you're like what's the matter with you get over it you know you just stop reacting and be like what can i do to help you in this situation just even changing your approach to the other person i think is really important yeah understanding somebody else's perspective um is is i think key sometimes we we just kind of fall into our own biases where we we just we, autopilot you know just responding in in pre phrases that are kind of like just stuck in our brains and just they just come out automatically and if we don't realize if they impact someone negatively that builds up that tit for tat kind of uh, response and then you know people get sarcastic and uh and and, and things kind of es escalate from that point on and and things become bitter um, well, I'm super glad that you set up the, um, uh, the Facebook page to, to share and kind of build a community around this. I, I think um, reframing divorce and uh, when, when that's the, the final solution in a sense of, of uh, letting go and, and, and starting a new life um, is going to change how people view it. And uh, building out a support uh, support network is is critical nowadays. If 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 there's been ever time in which it's so much easier to do, it's it's now when we can just utilize all these technologies to kind of reach out to people, build these networks, and and build these um, um, support groups to help us and share experiences. And it's happening in all sorts of other fields, and why not in this one as well, right? For sure. Yeah, and I am part of some other Facebook groups about women and divorcing and just staying in them to be able to give a little, you know, piece of advice here and there. That's why I've stayed in those groups because mm -hmm. hopefully people can learn. You know, we're all here to learn from each other. And, and like you said, the social networking, it's so easy now to connect. That's right. And um, one of the things that um, um, I was thinking about as I was reading your book and I was learning about all these different, uh, you know, acronyms and, and things, whether as you were going through the court system and 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 um, so it was a, it's a memoir, it's how to book, but it's also a, a an educational um, book for you as well, because you've 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 had to research certain things and, and so on. So um, what were some of the um, I don't know, surprising or maybe unexpected things that you've learned as you were going through the process of writing the book um, in terms of like, oh, I need to talk about this that I've experienced. Is there a name for it? Like, you know, um, medically or, or, or um, you know, uh, um, professionally, one of them, uh, which is in your happy, happily ever after uh, chapter, uh, one of them is gaslighting. And as I was reading, 
I'm like, gaslighting? What? <laughs> what is gaslighting? <laughs> Angela, what is gaslighting? Oh, boy. I wish I would have known about it before. <laughs> um, gaslighting is an old term, and it comes from a movie, like a, decades ago, a movie. And basically, it's talking about how someone will deny the truth over and over and over to the point where you as the receiving end of that you start to feel like you are questioning your own self and your own sanity you know and it happens so many times where there'd be say for example a text between my ex and i or something that was literally written down that he stated and i said no that's not what you said and i'd resend the text back to him and he would argue that i'm reading it wrong you know i i don't know how in the world when I'm showing you your own words, you don't understand them, but that's the kind of stuff that would happen all the time. It was denying, you know, I'll, I'll tell this story. It's also very, very crazy. There was, and this happened again more than once, there were a few times when my ex, when we were still living in the same house, literally wet his pants. And we're in an argument and this happens and I'm like, you just peed your pants. He's like, no, I didn't. You did because I'm looking at it, you know? And it's like, you're arguing about something that's in front of your face, but nope, you're making it up. You're lying. You're lying just to, to make me crazy and all this. And I'm like, am I seeing what I'm seeing? You know, you start to question yourself because you now are like, I'm already in a crazy situation. Now mm -hmm. I'm being told that I, my mind is playing tricks on me. Is it? Am I really here? You know, and it's just the, the oddest thing ever. And in, in, in that's that's the term. It's it's called gaslighting, and it's just an it's a crazy thing where you start to literally question your sanity and if the stuff you're seeing is really happening because you've been you're being told so many times that it's not. You know, so that is. I mean, you can drive someone crazy, I guess, if you had enough time to. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. That's so, I mean, is what I wish I knew before. So you know that. that we can't we can't leave that thread on on uh, on spun right now. Peeing your pants, uh, your ex husband. Uh, you 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 brought it up, and I can't leave the audience uh, <laughs> guessing and just kind of uh, what happened. Tell tell it. Tell me more. I, you know, I think I think part of it was the alcoholism. I think that was part of it. There were also some other issues that I talk about in my book where. Um, he was diagnosed with DID, which is dis dissociative identity disorder. So that is the um, new term for multiple personality disorder. And he will deny that, of course, but I was there in the, in the office with him when it was diagnosed in the doctor's office, amongst other diagnoses. But anyway, you know, when you're dealing with someone that, that loses chunks of time, for example, um, there was a time where there was an argument and I just thought, I'm just gonna sit and let it go, see how long this takes. And it was literally two hours. And he went into the other room, took a shower and came back and I said, and I thought to myself, I just wanna try something. I said, do you know where you were the last two hours? I said, were you at, were you at work? Were you out with friends? Were you here? Where were you the last two hours? And he didn't know. So that to me was really scary. And, and then, like I said, more things happening, you know, with the bathroom accident, stuff like that, where he's somewhere in his head that isn't present. And in people with DID, they do not retain memories of the other characters they are living with. So you don't, there are missing chunks of time, depending on who you are. You know, I saw a lot of that too in his texting. He would start conversations that were like months old off of a different text that like i don't know where where he was his head was at but it was these different missing chunks of time where you know when you're so and so you're that person and you don't know what the other person is doing so yeah i mean the wetting the pants thing like i said it happened more than once and it, it was just ridiculous but he i don't even think he was aware of it and you know maybe it was the alcohol too where he was so inebriated that that was part of it as well but yeah, you start to think I'm living in some kind of crazy situation that these things should never be happening, you know, and and that's part of the unhealthiness of it, too, that what you are used to is your normal. 
and normal for you is chaos and insanity. And so how do you then break out of your normal? And sometimes that's a scary thing too, where you don't know what's coming next. So that is maybe a block for you to change something in your life. But yeah, the, the, the craziness that I experienced, I mean, that right there, that story's worth buying the book, right? I mean, really? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, there's a there's a lot of stuff that happened that it, you just have no idea why that would be happening, and then to argue about it that it's not happening, I I don't know. But, uh, I'm just yeah, ha- I'm just happy that I've that I found that there's actually not an actual term for it. <laughs> um, so there you have it, folks. Gaslighting. Uh, uh, yep. and I'm just gonna uh, uh, read it uh, quickly from your book. Um, gaslighting, by definition, is a form of emotional abuse where the abuser repeatedly manipulates situations to trick the victim into distrusting their own memories and perceptions of situations. Mm-hmm. It's like driving you crazy. Yes. But it has a definition, gaslighting people. I wonder what f- what movie was that from or what... Um, I believe um, it was. There, it might have been called Gaslighter or the Gaslighter, something like that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I'm trying to find a quote over here um, uh, by Alan Greenspan and, and um, who, because when you mentioned uh, that texting uh, situation where you were talking, were texting like that and you feel like, no, this is, look, you wrote it yourself right over here. It's, it's, it's in words, right? It's, here's a fact. This is not an opinion. You, you sent this text, right? I think Alan Greenspan had an uh, unbelievable uh, um, phrase that he that he uttered to someone, but I have to find it because I cannot even replicate it. But it's something to the effect of like, "What I said uh, is not what what you th- what you thought I said," but it's just so convoluted in his brilliant you know mind uh, that it just it's it's just humorous. But I couldn't find it in time right now. So, <laughs> what else did you find as you were uh, writing this book other than gaslighting? <laughs> um, narcissism, I suppose, too, you know, where you're always right, no matter what. And, and that was a big part of it. And I think just I wish I maybe I should write, write um, some terms out, I could make them up my own, you know, because there were just so many things that happened that really had no explanation. And um, I think part of it is just dealing with a lot of mental health issues. And, you know, there'd been a lot of diagnoses with my ex and just just learning about those kinds of things. And even though you know that it's happening, trying to convince someone, especially when you have all of these issues, is is hard because they don't tend to believe other people and they don't tend to want to see what's wrong, you know. And that that is is a big chunk of it, too. And I wish along with divorce, I wish the mental health aspect didn't have such stigma as well because then hopefully more people would go into um, go into you know counseling, get some help and, and such. Um, for the DID, there was something I, and I'm hoping I don't get the letters mixed up. EDMR or it's in my book and I know I have it correct in there, but it's where you have a wand with a light on the end and it, and it goes back real quickly back and forth and it tries to integrate and bring back, memories and cancel out negative things so he was set up for that kind of a treatment but then never went on to get it but that was Mm -hmm. something that near our area in the next state over it was very close by that we had set up to do so i mean there's different things mental health wise that i learned about too and that's you know not to mention all the different like you said court acronyms and all those different Mm -hmm. legalese pieces that that you learn too which you know, it's crazy that I would have to know them. But even my kids know different things. What's an OFP? What's what's CHPS? You know, all of these different acronyms that hopefully no one needs to know. But that's kind of where where you're at at a certain point. Yeah. So funny you mentioned EDR. EDR is one of those um, um, uh, techniques, uh, therapies that actually I, uh, Dr. Julie talks uh, in her book. Oh. Uh, um, uh, living empowered EDR is, is based on the up, uh, rapid eye movement, which uh, yes. kind of makes you alternate, and and you can have a one. There's different modalities. It could be just uh, eye movement. It could be uh, hearing. Actually, it could be like a audible thing, where they kind of alternate between. And uh, and um, for more information, you have to read um, Dr. Julie's uh, book. <laughs> A shameless plug over here, but I found I found the quote that I wanted to to read to you, and you're gonna get a, a crack out of this. This is uh, this is Alan Greenspan, 
um, with respect to the text message that you uh, that you got from your husband that he disputed what he said uh, in the text message. Here's Alan Greenspan saying, I know you think you understand what you thought I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. That sounds like something he'd say. <laughs> 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 you can read this like 20 times and you're still wrapping your brain like what <laughs> yeah. but yeah. that's what it kind of feels sometimes when you talk to to people and they and they're like no that's not what i meant no no like but it's like but i don't understand how can i interpret these words differently and and you know like it's just so it's it's so uh objectively there but you're still disputing it so i can see how that must have been infuriating when that happened to you uh gosh no that I, I know that everybody everybody had that kind of experience with someone at some point in their life it's like what do you mean you said it <laughs> yeah well and one of the big things my lawyer had said throughout she would just shake her head and said you can't rational with the irrational right you can't rationalize with somebody that's irrational in their way of thinking so just stop you mm -hmm. know and that's where i came around to just stop responding because mm -hmm. you know what it doesn't matter what I say back, whether it's a yes or no. You know, there was one time where we were in Wisconsin Dells. It was supposed to be our redeeming family vacation. And he had actually, my ex had actually jumped out of a moving vehicle um, over a conflict about mini golf, no less. So anyway, so I thought, well, okay, we're going to carry on and, and we're not stopping the car this time. I mean, this isn't the first time. So we carried on. Okay, and, that's going to be another one that you're going to have to unpack. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but we ended up having to, there's a big scene. We were at a campsite spending the week. There's a big scene. And I said, you know what? Let him go. And then we are leaving because we need to get out of here. I didn't know what was coming next, if he was going to come back and what state of mind that would be in. So we left the camper. We just got in the truck. And, and so I drove and I'm thinking in my head, think like a criminal. What would be the hotel that I'd want to hide at? Because this is how you start to think. And so I pulled into the first room like, this makes no sense. We've stayed here before as a family. The, the parking lot's facing the street. What am I doing? This is so dumb. So I turned around and I'm like, you know, Wisconsin Dells, tourist trap of America. Best. I love it. You know, poor people's Disneyland. I'll just give a plug right there. But I got, I'm like, get off the strip. You cannot be on the strip here because it's like the Wisconsin Dells strip of Vegas, you know? So I'm like, get off the strip, go to a place without a water park, go to a nondescript holiday inn, get somewhere that's nowhere you'd ever want to be if you were in the Dells with kids. So I did, I went to a, a holiday inn, parking lot in the back, made sure. So I felt like we were runaways, but I, at this point it had gotten so out of control that I thought, I. I don't know what is coming. And this was the last trip and the last straw where finally I said, you're no longer in the house. So if that shows you a little bit about what this trip vacation was like. So anyway, getting back to my point, there were text messages from him that night, you know, two in the morning, such, and he's like, do you even care about me? And I texted back, yes. And then he texts back, how dare you tell me you don't even care about me? So how do you misinterpret yes so that's kind of you know that's the kind of point we got to where i'm saying yes and you're telling me that i just said no so i don't know how you can mess that up but that's that's where we were at so there's such a breakdown in even interpreting a simple one word answer that there was just no point anymore some people can do it i remember bill clinton well, uh, had an opinion on on <laughs> <laughs> they get real you know this no in this context means <laughs> yeah so i mean it's it's just you want to hear what you want to hear and then you make it be your reality which is kind mm -hmm. of where we were at like you know he's going to make his reality his own reality and that's fine but i don't want to be there with you anymore you know so right. where we're at i hope he was okay when he jumped out of a moving car <laughs> Yeah, you know, we were going on an exit, so it was it was okay. <laughs> but yeah, and then apparently what happened, what I was told, um, is that he had hitchhiked to the next closest town and then hung out at a truck stop and waited for his dad to pick him up and, and such. And, and that's fine, too. You know, if you want to leave our family vacation early, that's great. But 
Yeah, it was at that point where, you know, I came back home from the kids and I had never driven the camper before. I, I had driven it a half hour one other time. But at the end of the trip, I did stick it out with the kids and we had a great time. I mean, we did, we did like canoeing, which was never, he never wanted to do. We went to restaurants that like he never wanted to go to. So I thought, this is the best. I'm doing whatever I want, you know. So that was kind of freeing. And it was on that trip at that, you know, nondescript Holiday Inn where each of the kids, we were just in the regular pool they had there. And each of the kids individually, and like I say, I have four boys, they each came up to me and said, it's just better when he's not here, which is heartbreaking. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it was the point that goes, even if my kids know it, okay, we, we need to start the process. We need to start looking at ways to disengage from this tangle of what now has become our life because it's just not healthy. It's not fun. It's not peaceful. And that's not where you want you and your kids to be. So that's, that's what we, that was kind of a big, a very big turning point for us where I said, we're, we're done here. So, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sad. I mean, this is, well, I'm going to say two things. One is uh, with such stories and such experiences that you went through, it's, it's, it's easy to connect that, you know, that you are writing uh fictional stories and books right now because it's easy to it's a it's an easy launch pad <laughs> um i'm saddened yeah i'm saddened that uh you know your husband who clearly had some uh, um health issues and, and and mental health issues um you know uh you both guys went through all of this uh i'm sure this was an, an ordeal for for both of you how, how do you put closure on like you, you you like you said 24 years of marriage how do you put closure on that and because you obviously care for for uh cared care for him cared for him for so many years in, in a relationship you know where is he at now uh how did you put a closure on that uh hopefully he's he's getting some help that he needs and and uh and found this divorce and as a launch launch pad for his own uh new you know avenue in life do you do you think about what you know? Is he getting better? Is he getting some help? Is he, and how did you put closure on that so that he's part of his own life now? Um, you know, I don't know if he's getting help, and I, I don't, I don't know that he will admit to that. He was put into um, a thirty day treat, or I, it might be a twenty eight day, but a month long treatment program too for issues that came to be as, and I. He told me that it was his own choice to go into treatment. He had coworkers tell me that it was a it was contingent on him keeping his job. So whichever one it may be, he did go into a inpatient treatment program, and within a month coming out, he had gotten a DWI. So that didn't work, I guess, or didn't take it seriously enough, or there is a relapse. And, and to me, I still believe he's drinking. The kids have seen him out on the property where they all hunt. And he seemed very inebriated. They said, you know, they don't have any contact anymore. He is um, allowed visitation that is um, supervised. And he does not take advantage of that anymore. So they have not actually seen him since um, June of 2018. So my oldest two are adults now and they can have whatever relationship they'd like. You know, everybody has everybody's phone number, texting, whatever, but there's really not a lot of back and forth. And basically from what I gather from the kids, there's been no change. And, you know, I wish people all the best. I hoped the whole time that we had a relationship that he would find a way to get some help, go to some counseling, understand a few things about himself. You know, he, he did have a rough childhood of his own. And that I think stems a lot of things that he did later on stems from that. Um, I'm, great friends with his sister, which was an, an odd thing to have developed over the years, you know, because usually family lines, they're very split as far as, oh, I'm taking your side, I'm taking this, you know, that kind of thing, which is too bad, but I'm great friends with the sister. And she said, it's just, it's kind of a mess. So she doesn't really associate either. I know he still is employed because I still get child support that I garnish. I hope 
that he he has friends that will show him that maybe he needs to, you know, take some steps to get some help and to get healthy. Is that going to happen? Probably not. Cause I mean, if, if his family, I think if his wife and kids maybe weren't important enough for him to go and, and get that help and take it seriously, especially with all the things we did try as far as family counseling, marriage counseling, he had been in a few, a few outpatient treatment programs for alcohol as well. So, I mean, I don't know at what point is your rock bottom. I, I'm not sure some people, they don't get, they don't have a rock bottom, you know, in, I don't know. I, I wish him all the best. I hope that he he does come out to find somebody special and, and you know, change before that happens so that new person doesn't have to deal with things. But as far as relationships with the kids, I think that's the hardest. You know, that's kind of the heartbreaker of all of it. But, you know, kids are very resilient, too, and they adapt real well. Um, what was the second part of your question? Sorry, I went off a little bit there. No. <laughs> well, I think you covered it. You know, you know what he's doing now, and 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 how yeah. did you put? I guess um, the other the other yeah, part of the question closure. was like, how did you put closure? Sometimes there isn't closure, you know, and and I think maybe that has to be your closure, where you're not going to get, say, apologies, or you're not going to get, a, oh, I see what I could have done better, or oh, I'll try working on this, you know, with the kids. Maybe you don't get it closure sometimes. And maybe it's the acceptance of not getting that that's for you, your own person is closure. And for me, like this book, to just get it out of my head and put it in a different place, I think that maybe was my closure. And and I had to wait a few years. I couldn't have done this like while I was in, you know, I couldn't have written this book while I was in the divorce. It would have been too much or mm -hmm. even a year out or two years out. You know, I think you have some time to heal and just be as a person and let things settle into place. And then it kind of is a gradual and maybe some people have an epiphany, like I'm done with it. For me, when I signed the papers, I was like, this is my ticket to not care. And I know that might sound crass that I don't care anymore, but I had to not care to disassociate myself from that unhealthiness. Because if I still cared, then I'm still part of it. And I don't want to be in that spot. You know, I care about my kids' feelings as far as how it affects them. But do I really care and do I really want to follow, you know, my ex to see what he's doing here, there, and ever? No, I really don't. So, and maybe that's my closure. I, I don't have, that's my ticket not to care. Well, it's, it sounds like he, he has some family that um, hopefully um, is helping him deal with, with his demons. And, um, and, and um, you never know when people can uh, recover from things. And, and it's, I guess, progressively harder in life as you kind of get entrenched even more and more in the way you, you do certain things. But... I think it is all about the support network, uh, maybe moments of, of um, introspection, which which uh, maybe it's that rock bottom when you hit it, and hopefully it's not uh, it's not uh, um, traumatic. Um, how are your kids reacting to your book when you wrote it or when you started writing it? How was that when you because they have a a unique perspective, right? They are. They are they are sort of in it in the environment that you know in, in part of the experience that happened. When you told them, "Hey, I'm writing this book, and by the way, I'm going to call it Divorce is Awesome." <laughs> Their perspective <laughs> is like, "Okay, mom." <laughs> um, so how how was that? How how do they react? And um, you know, tell me about those dynamics. Well, I think they understand the whole point is you know that divorce obviously the process process is not awesome. I mean, that's, it's terrifying, it's struggles, it's challenges, but to get to the point of where we are with, with the peace and the joy and the calm, replacing all that daily chaos, that's the awesome part. You know, getting out of the situation is the awesome part. And my kids, I gave them each a copy of the book too. And, you know, they knew I was writing it as I was writing it. And there was, there was mixed reaction in that they didn't want to read the whole thing because they didn't want to relive the whole thing. And I think, you know, they wanted to read the parts that were titled about themselves. That was the first thing they, you know, they flipped to, let's see what she wrote about me. But, you know, they just all said, but I did it once. I don't want to do it again. And I think that is 
something that they will revisit and i think something that they will revisit as time goes on and i think as maybe when they have um their own kids you know to reflect back but i get that too what you know when you write a book you're going to be re you're editing all the time you're you're editing as you go you're editing after the whole product you're going back and changing things you know and there's just such a process where you read your your work dozens and dozens and dozens of times but since it has come out in physical form. I have not read the book. I have not reread my own book either because I think my kids and I were on the same page. We don't we don't want to relive it anymore. Like I can talk about it in a different perspective, like right now, putting that spin on it. But do I want to go and relive all the events? No. So they want the book and they have the book, but to reread it all in its entirety again, I think it's too soon for them to do that you know so they were there they were there live they they know it all i mean you if we talked about a certain part mentioned it yep i remember that and then they go off on their own spiel you know so they remember all of it it's in their heads but now hopefully it doesn't just like me it, it doesn't have to be in your heads all the time it's in a book so if you want to look back that's fine and if you don't that's fine too and some of that maybe is the healing where you don't want to revisit it's it's done and over with so in part, I take uh, you writing the book is, is a healing process and kind of externalizing, putting things on paper, uh, reprocessing it and, and putting closure to it. And um, based on all the experiences that you shared and some of the crazy stories that happened to you, um, let's talk about like what's next for you. What you know, you mentioned that you're, uh, you're writing uh, uh, fiction books now and uh, they, that are uniquely connected to uh, this first book. Uh, Tell us more about it. Um, we chatted about it just just briefly, and it's 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 a uh, it's an interesting story. So, uh, Angela, tell us a little bit more about what you what's next for you. What books you're going to be uh, are writing, and how are they connected and disconnected from 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 these experiences in the first book? Okay. Um, I have written two fiction books. I have not published them yet, but I just finished editing. I and I like to put stuff to the side for a little bit and then come back to it, and make sure it's how I want it to be. But um, my first book. The, it's in a series in my first book there starts out actually in a in a place that is in my nonfiction book it's actually in the Texas chapter because when events happened in Texas and I thought oh what do I do here and it, it was kind of a scary situation where we had to call an ambulance because of my husband's drinking and all this that occurred and and I sat there going oh I could probably end this all now do I try to get them tossed over the balcony? And I mean, that's a scary thought when you then start planning a murder in your mind. But that's where my fiction book starts, where here's this lady, things have happened, and now she needs to make a decision. Is this going to be it? And as she's planning this, there's another person that doesn't catch her in the act, because the act has not occurred yet, but she's out on the balcony planning this, and a person looks down from the floor above and says, yeah, I think eight floors would do it. Because she's trying to decide would eight floors tossing somebody off a balcony, would that kill them? And so she finds that real interesting. And he says, I think I can help you out. She's like, so what's going on here? And so they meet and it turns out she doesn't realize it till years later, but this guy is a professional murder planner. He doesn't kill anybody, but he plans it and gives you the tools to do so. And then he's out of it. Then he's out of the situation. He doesn't check on if it happened or anything, but he's done his job. So they end up, of course, because you got to have a little romance in a book, they end up getting married. Well, this is years later. And so he introduces her to some people and is like, you know, go, go work at this women's shelter. I make enough money. You don't have to work. Go volunteer at this women's shelter. And she meets a lady who turns into her best friend, this Gabriella, who turns into her best friend. And, and she notices that these women that come into the shelter really want to pray with Gabriella. And so she's like, that's weird. So why, you know, what is, what is this connection? And Gabriella has a, a prayer notebook that she jots some things down in as as people tell her their prayers. And it turns out that, you know, this, this other character named Angel starts to realize all of these people that Gabriella is writing about disappear. So all of these people that these women come and pray about with Gabriella, they, they somehow disappear. So now, 
does Gabriella have a direct line to God? Is she cooked in with some kind of murderous plan, you know, that she she kind of outsources like, oh, kill this guy out, you know, is she related to the mob or is she doing it herself? So as Angel learns more about Gabriella and then, you know, Gabriella feels that she can be trusted in, in they start to find people within this network and they get together as a group and all these people have basically offed their significant other for, you know, good reasons. There's good backstories to these women, you know, but they've done this and they come in together as a group because they don't really say a lot, but knowing that they have each other creates the environment where they're not going to go accidentally spill to anybody else about what they've done. And it's all these people that end up getting away with it because they were such bad guys to begin with. Nobody really misses them. So it's all these adventures they go mm. on in how they find people and how society is better. <laughs> so they're they're really the angels in disguise, you know, that that is creating these scenarios where you just saved another family, you know, that kind of a thing. So I, I just want to clarify. I just want to clarify that <laughs> Angela right These now is talking about fictional. Books. Yes, books. Do not murder people. <laughs> um, but they're do fun, you, though. Do, do you? That's, yeah, that's I mean, i I need to talk. I need to talk to. Um, I mean, I need to talk to my wife and see what her perspective on that is. Like, if if uh, is this like healthy <laughs> to uh, to kind of like, hey, you know, um, I had these thoughts. And uh, but they're just, you know, I'm not going to act on them, obviously. And it's just like, you know, it's going to be a book. It's going to be a fictional book, but it's obviously yeah. heavily influenced by your experiences um, with your with your ex and uh, and where that may lead to. Well, I guess as long as you don't act on it, it's uh, it's OK. <laughs> right. And, you know, it starts off with a scene from from my life. But then, you know, there's so many other scenarios that come in in, in so many other different ways. And, and I suppose if anybody ever checks my search history, there's going to be a problem because I <laughs> there's a lot of ways to get rid of people. But, you know, you think about all these, you know, look at all these other people that are killing people in books. It's not like they're out doing it in real life. You know, you right. have so many thrillers and mysteries and murder mysteries and all that, you know, and it's it's something that am I out planning murder? Not really, but these characters, they're just, you just feel for them and you're like, yeah, that totally was validated. She totally should have killed that person. You know, you start to feel for them and what their stories are and you, and you, it's kind of a, and I'm not trying to change anybody's perspective on murder, but you start to really feel for these characters and go, oh yeah, that was okay, I guess. You mm -hmm. know, and you kind of start questioning yourself going, oh, do I think it's okay? You know, but it's these characters in there, you, you know, that are fighting for their life. And I guess it, what happens, you know, it, it happens. So they save themselves. So it's kind of a self-preservation story mm -hmm. as well, where, you know, you kind of can take, I mean, I'm not saying go out and kill people, obviously, but I mean, you start taking some lessons learned from how to self-preserve and that, and that kind of stuff. So they're just fun books and I've got two done now and, mm -hmm. and I, like to put it maybe do another one before I put them out we'll see yeah so I, I would want to be best friends with all my characters they're really so there's some really cool women <laughs> <laughs> um well you know the concept of that kind of uh, uh mind work was um was ex ex um, explored in in several different uh um I guess some movies or 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 some books, and and I think it's a th healthy way of kind of maybe therapeutic, maybe a way of of kind of maybe even put, putting closure. Maybe this is your next next level, next stage of of of, of putting closure uh, from uh, from your um uh, uh, from your relationship. And this is just kind of like, all right, well, obviously I wasn't going to do anything crazy and 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 uh, unethical and and illegal, but. Um, Kind of like you, your life has been just so heavily influenced by by that uh, divorce and by by those experiences that you had over many years that you know your mind just kind of wanders into these spaces where you can kind of elaborate and and you know who just jumps out of a moving vehicle but um, I mean that sounds like a movie <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like this is going to be a, a uh, an interesting journey how far do you do you uh, do you plan to take that writing those books are you do you enjoy uh, writing those uh, those fiction fiction books. Yeah, I really do. I, I do enjoy writing them. And so that's why I kind of wanted to make it a series because there was just always some more or I've created another character where I'm like, oh, this would be perfect to be friends with so-and-so, you know. So mm -hmm. there's there's that too. And then my um, 
one son, he said, well, why don't you write a book for kids, like teenager kids? And so I started writing a book just recently too that, you know, they have to, there's, there's kids set up and there's a grandmother who then there's there's witches and magic and stuff like that but she's set them up to do certain things and then they kind of figure her out as far as she wants to take over the world and so you know there's a there's a lot of different kinds of themes you can weave through anything you know give mm -hmm. me three characters i can make up a story about that you know there's there's fun and just exploring and if a, if idea doesn't work then it doesn't work and if it mm -hmm. does you know hopefully you kind of touch somebody along the way as far as, you know, hitting on something that they makes them stop and pause and go, oh, well, that makes sense. You know, there's a lot of themes that are overlying these books, underlying in, in books that, you know, you can take things away from every book that I've ever read, whether it's a, a murder mystery or Stephen King or David Balducci, you know, anything, there's always a little nugget of something in there that's a life lesson, you know? Mm -hmm. So right. that's the kind of that's the the fun in books you can mm -hmm. you can teach without explicitly teaching mm -hmm. so do, do, right do you think that your um, your experience with your divorce uh, was the kind of uh, the origination of, of of wanting to write these books do you think that that all those experiences and now you know being divorced did, did that kind of spawn and 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 help to uh, would you even, would you write those books if it wouldn't be for, for the for the experience of in divorcing and writing mm -hmm. the first book or were or, or was it like hey I wrote a book a memoir and how to book about divorce um, and now I'm kind of extrapolating from that and because of those experiences I'm, I'm gonna go in and write some fiction books in part like I take it in part therapeutically but also um, just kind of as it's the beginning of new life right you uh, you started a new chapter in your life and you're and you're doing something new do you think you would write those books if if you wouldn't uh, go through the divorce boy maybe maybe I wouldn't have you know especially that that opening scene it was it was basically taking out of real life so mm -hmm. you know I suppose you get that spark from somewhere mm -hmm. and whether you know the subconscious does do a lot of stuff but but yeah I maybe I wouldn't have so I'm glad, reason, I'm yeah. glad I did write that first one you know and in mm -hmm. another good thing I guess that came out of the divorce too you know mm -hmm. I, Books, writing books that would mm -hmm. that would be another great thing that came from it right and that's that's kind of that kind of takes us all the way back to um, uh, to your book in which you wrote um, that you know, there's always something positive that comes out of negative right and I think it's a, it's a For truism sure. that a lot of people subscribe with uh, that you know if when you're in the moment and it's 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 terrible it's 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 uh, it's traumatic it's ne it's all negative but but only later do you see some positive things uh, um, you know coming out of it and um, and on that note I think we kind of uh, close the loop on on your first book and then your following books and your whole experience any last uh, thoughts in terms of any lessons learned or anything that you want to tell the audience um, before we head out you know, I think everything happens for a reason. So I, you know, even all the craziness and ridiculousness that I went through in my divorce, would I, would I have changed it? Not necessarily because it's made me who I am today. It's made my kids who they are today. And it's made my whole outlook change for the better based on that, you know, and I think people are put in your path for a reason. I think certainly with my new husband we ran into each other we had known each other years and years ago he was my uh, pizza guy and we actually ran each other um, at a hardware store twice in one week because soon as i got divorced everything in the house started breaking like every light bulb you know blew out i had to go buy tools and in things just to do simple repairs at my house and so yeah we ran into each other twice at a hardware store and decided to go on a date and and there we go, you know, so I think everything happens for a reason, whether it's divorce, positive, negative, you know, you can all turn, you can turn anything into a positive when you've got that shift in attitude and perspective. Well, there you have it, folks. Angela Polson, author of Divorce is Awesome. Check out the book and um, and may it change your life in all the positive ways, the way it uh, changed Angela's life. Thank you for being on the podcast. I really enjoyed it. Um, I wish you all the best. 
and um, and we'll stay in touch. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing your books published and uh, sharing your story with uh, with others. Thank you so much. <laughs>